So this is, this is my talk. Um, hopefully the slides are up. Um, empty your cup, Reflections on Learning Ember. Um, who am I? I am Matt Jones, a senior developer at Neo Innovation. Um, I've been a Rails dev since, well, let's not talk about how long. Um, oh, quite a while. Um, a couple of quick shout outs um, before I get started. Um, big thanks to uh, Chris Westra, who was a pair on most of the code that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and helped discover some of this stuff uh, that uh, I'll be talking about. Um, and as well, in memoriam, Jim Wyrick, um, our, our fearless chief scientist of Neo Innovation, uh, who passed away uh, in February. Um, so this talk is dedicated to him. Um, he uh, was a firm believer in, uh, in teaching and learning and sharing knowledge. So, so the problem. Um, the problem is that if you have a lot of experience in a particular problem domain, um, you can get into a situation where you assume that things are true when they're not. Um, and especially with Ember, uh, old concepts attached to words can lead to a lot of difficulties. Um, because if you think that you know what a word means, but the system believes it means something different, um, you're in for trouble. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to approach this. Uh, one possible solution, uh, read everything. So read absolutely everything you can get your hands on. Um, it turns out this isn't practical for lots of reasons. One is nobody has that kind of time. Um, and for another, uh, you don't even know what you're supposed to be reading for. Um, and it's, as people, it's really easy to, if you're reading something and you think you know what it means, it's very easy to just sort of skim past the parts that tell you that you're wrong. Um, so reading is not necessarily going to solve your problem. Um, asking somebody with more experience is another possibility. Um, but then you get back to the same problem. If you don't understand what you don't understand, um, you don't even know what questions to ask. Um, and even more so, if you are assuming that you know the answers, you really are not inclined to ask questions. So the best solution is expose your ignorance. Deal with the fact that you don't know what you're doing. And that's fine. Embrace it. Accept that, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing, um, and that's fine. I'll, I'll just keep learning, because that's what we all do. Um, and keep a beginner's mind. So we'll, I'll, I'll be returning to this throughout the talk. Uh, but basically, the, there's this Zen idea of beginner's mind. It's keep your mind empty. Don't bring all of your previous uh, assumptions and interactions and everything else to the table. Um, and failing to do that can get you into a lot of trouble. So. I'm going to have some examples. Um, pretty much all the examples that I have are from uh, an internal Neo project, uh, which was written in Ember. Um, and just in case I screw up and say some things that aren't true anymore, um, do note this work was completed a couple months ago, right before 1.3 dropped. Um, so if this is being watched in the future and Ember has changed all the rules again, just, just know that it, was, it made sense when I said it. Uh, so the very first example. Um, is passing parameters around between your, your actions or even pieces of your code. Um, now, as server-side developers, uh, we're used to a particular style, uh, which is every time you go through a round trip from the client to the server, um, you have to convert all your parameters to strings to get them over the wire and then convert them back into everything from numbers to objects to whatever uh, back on the server side. Uh, so it leads to code that looks a lot like this. Um, you know, you have a method that wants to, call, you have something that wants to call code on the server, and so you pass it this string, in this case the slug of our thing, um, and then the code on the other end takes that string and rehydrates it back into an object. Um, for instance, here in this case, I'm finding it in the list of doodads that I have. Uh, and that's fine, but it's really unnecessary. Um, in Ember, you can get away with a lot less. Um, because you're not round tripping to the server, you're not passing through that barrier where everything has to be a string, uh, you can do things where you just pass objects. Um, it's not harmful to pass string, but it is annoying. Um, it becomes harder to test things sometimes because then the object really does have to be in that collection as opposed to, say, just being a spy that you passed in. Um, and you, you know, it's a little bit of performance Im impact, but the, the bigger challenge is it's just a bad idiom. Um, and the more Ember you write, the more you'll realize, hey, I have these bad habits. Uh, so the lesson learned, uh, challenge your assumptions about how things should be done. Um, 
If you say, hey, I know how to pass parameters between parts of my code, and all you've been doing is server-side programming, you do not know really how to pass parameters between pieces of your Ember code. So the next big example um, is this idea of one page, one controller. So in Rails, we get very set into this pattern of, okay, I have a screen of information that I'm showing the user, and an awful lot of the times, that's all powered by one controller action uh, over on the server side. Um, and so that one controller action is responsible for setting up a whole lot of different bits. Um, we will typically use different strategies to make that less apparent, everything from before filters, to presenters, to decorators, to all sorts of things. Um, so here's a classic example. This is from our internal utilization tool uh, at Neo. So there's this bar that I've got in the, in the red dotted line. Um, it's a, basically a, a selection of tabs. And the idea is that when you click on one of the tabs, the list down at the bottom will show the particular people associated to that tab. And if you hover over one of the tabs, uh, a section of the graph corresponding to that tab will highlight itself. Uh, so there, that, that tab bar does a bunch of stuff. This is what the code looked like when we started. Uh, don't try to read it too hard because it's bad. Uh, but what you'll notice here is we have a snapshots controller. <clears throat> and the snapshot is basically the list of things that we're looking at there with all the different people. Um, and the snapshots controller suddenly has acquired all this knowledge uh, about how the chart is represented, the CSS styles that are applied to the SVG in the chart. And it's going around and just doing things to the chart. So the snapshot controller had way too many responsibilities. Um, it's responsible for holding the current snapshot as its model. It's responsible for holding the selected tab because it needs to know which piece of that model to display. Uh, and when the selected tab change, when the hover tab changes, it's responsible for poking updates into the chart uh, to hide and show and highlight different things. That's not so great. Um, so one powerful thing that you can do in Ember is introduce more controllers. There's not this one controller, one view situation. So here we introduced a, a tool called lists controller, which if I go back to the chart, <coughs> lists controller responsibility is just what's in the red dotted box. That's the only thing that lists controller knows about. Um, so list controller how only does, well, it does two things. It maintains the selected state and it maintains the hovered state. Everything else in the app that needs that then just can attach itself as a property that follows what, what list controller is doing. Uh, list controller's model is a, is a list of plain Ember objects that filter the data in the snapshot. Um, the template then just pulls out a tiny little list component that only has to deal with, hey, am I being hovered over? Am I being clicked on? Um, and the chart, all the chart code gets sucked back into the charts controller uh, because now the chart can just attach the list controller and say, hey, whatever is being hovered, highlight it. Uh, so CSS classes used on the SVG are now localized to the same place where they're actually used. Um, and the one thing I hadn't mentioned, what about snapshots controller? Uh, turns out a snapshot controller disappears, or snapshot controller disappears entirely. Uh, the only responsibility it has left uh, is maintaining the current state of which snapshot is being viewed, which it's doing with its model attribute, and otherwise has no responsibilities left. <coughs> so the lesson learned here um, is that model view controller does not mean model view controller all the time. MVC is not MVC. Um, and gaps in the understanding of this architecture and assumptions that this is the same architecture that you've used elsewhere um, can lead you to really badly factored code. Um, yeah. Or if not badly factored uh, code that's in the wrong place, um, that sort of thing. Just as in Rails, uh, if you put code in an undesirable place, you have to pay the penalty. Um, so for instance, in Rails, if you are attempting to access the session from the model, uh, you're going to have a phenomenally bad time. Uh, you can't do it, and you shouldn't. Um, and hooks, in, in particular in Ember, are, are a key example of this. Um, there are hooks everywhere. Uh, words that mean one thing can mean something entirely different. Route is the classic example of that. So the routing system has all these hooks. They can do all these amazing things. 
Um, and if you forget to use them, you can be in trouble. So for instance, if you decide, well, I, I'm very good at Rails, and I know that controllers are responsible for loading data uh, for, your, for your models. Uh, no. No, they're not. Not in Ember. Um, so doing it right in this case means uh, using, the, using the route hooks uh, as they were intended. Um, and you get nice things as a result. So for instance, if you return a promise from a route hook, instead of having to figure out some convoluted way to actually <coughs> um, get that promise to resolve, um, the routing system will go, hey, you returned a promise. Uh, I'm going to pause the transition until the, until the promise uh, resolves. Uh, you don't have to write crazy code that starts depending on is loaded states on model objects and uh, just weird stuff. So if you work with the framework's expectations, uh, it's a huge, huge benefit. Uh, another great example, uh, in Rails, you have nested routes. <clears throat> we see nested routes all the time. Anytime you've got kind of a parent-child relationship, you know, maybe you have a blog and a post has some comments and you have a nested route for posts and comments. Um, so Ember route should be nested just like that, right? Uh, no, no they should not. Uh, so the, the key thing that I struggled with a great deal um, with Ember and nesting is that nesting is, does not represent that kind of hierarchical relationship. It can, it absolutely can, but it's far more important to understand the hierarchical relationship of the view. Uh, it's about rendering views inside of views. So sometimes if your UI matches that, um, you'll still get routes that are nested inside of each other in just the same way that you would expect. So as a concrete example, uh, this is another screenshot from a different piece of our internal allocation tool. So there are two big pieces uh, of, on this slide, one above the red dotted line and one below. Uh, above the line, there's kind of Chrome UI stuff. Uh, you know, you're selecting which office you're looking at. There's a button to add a new project. There's a control over the range of dates that you're viewing. And then below it, there's all of the projects and all of their allocations. Um, so originally, I think I lost the slide somewhere. Um, originally we had this and it was set up kind of oddly. There were office projects and we had an offices project controller that had a model that was an office and it was really, really baffling. Um, after a couple of major refactors, uh, we finally got this to somewhere sensible. Uh, and the key that we found to that was uh, that the office and date selectors are sort of generic. They are, which office have you got selected? And the route that we ended up with started with offices, had a slug for the office, and then said, okay, now you're looking at projects for that. And so we had this logical nesting of views where there's the chrome on the outside <coughs> with the, the bits on the top, and then there's an outlet on the bottom. And in the outlet, we drop all of the projects. So in that case, it was a perfect match for Ember's idea of nested routes. Um, so the project tracks are nested inside. Um, we actually didn't discover this nesting right away. At first, we, were, we, had, we went through several different permutations. We, had, we unnested the routes for about two days. Uh, we re-nested them in a different way. We unnested them again. We re-nested them in a different way. We finally really hit on what we needed to do uh, based on an external requirement. Uh, in addition to viewing, okay, I want to look at all the allocations grouped by project where the people are the little boxes and they're sort of assorted. Uh, the requirement came up, hey, you should uh, instead, we, we all, we'd also like to see for each person as, a, as a, a group all of the allocation, all of the projects that they're on in little boxes grouped together by person. Um, and it turns out that that makes the routing a lot more apparent because all of a sudden you're like, okay, I, I'm either looking at all the projects for this office or I'm looking at all the people for this office. Um, and that, that became a lot more clear that we were swapping out one piece of the view but keeping the rest of it the same. Um, so as a conclusion, um, expose your ignorance. The worst possible thing that you, you know, the worst possible thing you can do is stay quiet. There's an old, there's an old saying, uh, better to remain silent and be thought ignorant than to open your mouth and confirm it. That's literally the opposite of true uh, in, in programming because operating under the wrong assumptions gets you into vastly more trouble than just saying, hey, I don't understand what this is. Can I go read the docs for two minutes? Uh, and really, sometimes that's all it takes. It's just a little bit more information than you currently have 
just that tiny piece of conceptual comp comprehension that's missing. Um, validate your assumptions. If you believe that something works the way that you think it works, um, write something simple. Figure out, hey, does this actually work this way? Uh, don't go down the rabbit hole and write, write code for days and then turn it on and find out that nothing works the way that you expected. Um, and to further <laughs> reiterate that, understand your tools. If you do not understand what your tools are, what the assumptions your tools are making, you are going to eventually discover them and usually the wrong way. All right, that's it for me. I'm Matt Jones, work for Neo Innovation, uh, AL203CR on Twitter, GitHub, everywhere else. Uh, please hit me up if you have any questions, since obviously I can't answer many on the video. Um, and thanks for listening. Thank you.